gift from God with love to save us when we fall. And it's for you and for me, so we can live eternal. Anyhow, this morning, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome those that are online also. A um, couple things just want to remind you of. We do have a prayer request. It's still part out there in the chairs here, and I'll pick them up a little later and we'll pray for those needs. Um, Ellen just reminded me or asked me to remind everyone there are some needs yet for the birthday day, birthday bash event that we're going to be having. So if anybody can help out with that, please stop uh, in the back there in the fellowship area there and sign up. There. Um, another thing, just to remind everyone, today is the last day to get uh, any nominations you may have for uh, the leadership team. There are nomination forms. Uh, you come in the door and then back by the leadership board if you do want to put something on the nomination of that. Uh, encourage you to do that. Uh, with that, let's um, open in prayer and then we will do our call to worship. Father, today. We are just blessed to be able to just uh, take a deep breath and gather together and to just uh, take time to fellowship with one another and to worship you. Father, today we just ask for your presence now in this sanctuary. We ask for your Holy Spirit to anoint the word that Pastor Rob has for us and uh, also just touch the teachers that are working with our youth. Just anoint them with your spirit and touch those little lives and hearts through your word. Father, we just pray these things and just ask for your presence now in the precious name of Jesus. Let's uh, recite the uh, call to worship. If you could stand, please. <coughs> Praise the Lord.
be seated. Let's read from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As we sing Amazing Love, let's reflect on Christ's love. in love. 
A lot of times when I do a communion meditation, it's just based on some personal experiences I've had. So that's what I just want to share this morning. This message isn't going to be earth-shattering, but I want to honor the Lord. A couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go on an elk hunt with my son and a couple other individuals. And I have to be honest with you, those that hunt, how many of you pray that you get something? Are you honest? Be honest. <laughs> I was sitting all day, it was a six day hunt, it was the third day, I hadn't really seen anything. Third day I was sitting all day and I just was by myself. And it was just a neat time to honor the Lord. I just had time on your hands, you know, I, I call it I was sitting in my empty box. But I prayed that the Lord would just allow an elk to pass by and allow me to harvest one. <laughs> and the Lord blessed me. I did get an elk, I, I had the opportunity to shoot an elk, but I want to honor God in this because it was just a special time to me. And it wasn't all about getting an elk, but it was time to just be alone and acknowledge that the Lord is with us every day in everything we do. And we want to honor him for that. So I want to do that this morning for first of all. The second thing I just wanted to maybe tie in a little bit with communion. Um, this past week was Thanksgiving. And we had a nice fellowship time here at church, and those that weren't here at church, I'm sure you spent time with family. But what happens on uh, traditional gatherings? You know, we all gather together, but we all bring certain things to the table, and it was kind of neat to just sit back and, and look at all the food and the various things that went on. You know, we had various families here. There were some young people, some elderly people, and some in between, a mixture of everybody. Food. It was kind of neat to see. Everybody has a traditional dish, don't we? Some of us, in our family, and I got five kids, six kids, so, I mean, each one, one brings sweet corn, one brings buns, one potato, you know, they all have a special thing that you bring. Well, isn't it kind of like that, sitting right here, as we come before the communion table? Each one of us comes from various backgrounds, various activities going on in our lives. Some of us have good things going on. Some of us are struggling right now. But all of us come together and we share in one common cause, and that's to celebrate and to give praise and honor to Christ our Lord for the one thing he did. He died for us so that we could be saved. You know, as I set out in that uh, deer stand, I'm grateful that even though I screw up and I'm a mess at times, I'm still saved. You know, and I can count on that, and it's because of the blood of Christ and his dying for us. And today, it's a week of Thanksgiving, so I just want to give thanks for that in the little things that we do every day. This message isn't earth-shattering, it's just what I do, what I've done, observed in the last couple days, or a couple weeks. But you know, every day God is good to us. Good, bad, ugly, beautiful, whatever it is, we just have to hang in there and trust, and we know, and I want to honor him today. So let's pray. Father, this morning, I honor you. I thank you, Jesus, that you willingly came, and you gave your life and sacrificed your body and blood so that I might have a chance to be saved and to be with you forever. So, Father, I want to honor you. I want to give you praise. I want to give you glory. I want to give you honor. Now, as we are about to partake of those emblems that remind us of this sacrifice, I pray that you would just cleanse our hearts, just allow us to openly receive that free gift that you've given. And it's in that most precious name of Jesus I pray these things. Amen. In the back and in the front are the emblems. <laughs> Thank you. 
special needs beyond their concern. Okay. David just had one prayer request. It's for Lenny Melcher. We've been at St. Mary's in Rochester since Tuesday with kidney issues, so we'd like to pray for Lenny. Anything else that anyone needs prayer for? Okay, let's just uh, take a moment here and silent reflection and then I'll close in prayer. Father, this morning we are blessed. <clears throat> we are a blessed nation, Father. And it's just a privilege and an honor to just bow before you and and to just take a moment and just be silent and to just uh, reflect on how we are blessed, Lord. And we want to thank you for that. Father, today we want to pray for our nation. We just pray for uh, favor for our country and just ask that you would forgive us of our sins and just heal our land. Father, we just pray too for your nation Israel and your people. Father, may they come to know you and to accept you, Jesus, as your Savior. And uh, we just pray for continued blessing and protection over your country, Israel. Father, today as we lift up this need for Lenny Melcher, we just ask that you would just touch his body and just heal him, Lord. Just uh, be with the doctors and the nurses and uh, those that administer help there and just uh, allow for a healing. And Father, now as we... Uh, Enter in your presence and just anticipate your word. We just pray for Pastor Rob that his words would be clear and his words would be anointed. So now we just pray these things and ask for your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince peace and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins it was a moment where the mercy of God was on full display where love outweighed the crimson stain the sin which made communion with God impossible This death, this stench, sent from the depths, would no longer be left to permeate the hearts of man. The Creator was longing for His creation. For on this day, love made a way for grace to take away, erase, replace our brokenness. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son, the promised one, had come to change our eternity. That moment in Bethlehem, in a lowly stable, under a starry sky, Jesus was born. Our Savior, our Messiah. Grace in a manger. It's the most wonderful time of the year when the kids jingle belling and everyone's telling to be of good cheer. Join me. It's the most wonderful time of the year. For some people, it started way before Thanksgiving. But normally, the tradition of being able to celebrate the Christmas season, it takes place after Thanksgiving. Decorations, how many people got their decorations already up? Their lights are on. Okay. How many still have to work on their decorations yet? I know I do as well. I did finally get my outside lights turned on. That's important for me after Thanksgiving to get done. How about buying gifts? Anybody here get caught up in the Black Friday crowds to get the deals out there? 
Karen and I said we wanted to avoid Mankato at all costs on Black Friday weekend, especially the roundabout in front of High V. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Crazy place out there. But if you did, maybe you were a Black Friday shopper, got some good deals. I got some online that will be shipped to me instead. The National Retail Federation, the NFR, predicts holiday spending this year will be over $960 billion dollars with individual consumers on average spending $875 on gifts, food, decorations, and other Christmas seasonal items. Every Christmas in our households, we invest time and money into transforming our homes into festive features. And the ones that we love, we go and search for that perfect gift. We, we wrap it up with expectations and the thrill that it will bring on Christmas morning. The ultimate gift that's just right. We picture our loved ones opening that present with a, a gasp and an awe. It's wonderful. Thank you. And we begin to beam with delight for us being able to give that ultimate perfect gift. Charles Swindoll speaks of the most perfect gift. He says, quote, on that first Christmas, God gave the ultimate perfect gift to his loved one, to all of us. He wrapped heaven's treasure in a tiny frame of a baby, and beaming with delight, he gave us his one and only son. And on that night, like a proud father, God sent his angels to deliver a heavenly birth announcement to some astonished shepherds who rushed to see the baby born in an animal shelter, laid in a feeding trough as a make shift crib the ultimate gift is grace in a manger as a congregation we've just finished the book of galatians and it's fair to say that it's a book with a heavy dose of grace salvation through this gift of god grace is this undeserved generosity it's when goodness is shown independent of anything done that's worthy of it grace is the twin brother to mercy and a close relative to love grace is when kindness is lavished on one person from one to another even when it's not called for in fact the greatest present of grace is offered when the person that's receiving that gift is actually opposed to the one who's giving it because you see while we were still sinners christ what died for us the ultimate gift of christmas is grace seen in a manger so my question for this morning as we as we launch into this christmas season is this in the midst of our holiday season festivities how can we pass this ultimate gift that we've received in Jesus? How can we display the grace in a manger to others? So they too can beam with delight. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Father, for this wonderful time of the year. That's all made possible because of what Christmas is all about all about Jesus Christ, your love for this world, a message of hope and redemption. So I pray this morning as we launch into this season, amidst all the lights and celebration and festivities, we focus clearly on a manger and see this tremendous gift of grace. And Lord, use us to share that gift with others. In Jesus' name, amen. If you turn to the passage of John chapter 9, that's where I'll be camping out. I want to use this account of Jesus and the blind man as a backdrop for our message this morning. I want to use this encounter of this man that was born blind so that we could see in Jesus Christ himself how to wrap up God's love in a wonderful gift of grace. If you got your Bibles open, the very first verse we read from the NIV translation, as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. 
One consistent attribute we see of Jesus Christ as he walked here on earth is that he emulated mercy and grace. Instead of seeing disgusting sinners wailing in their consequences of their wayward lifestyle, Jesus had compassion. Matthew 15, a great multitude gathering for Jesus' teaching. Jesus says, I have compassion for these people. I don't want to send them away hungry. Mark 6, after, after Jesus and his disciples have gone away in their boat to a solitary place and the crowd figured it out and they ended up meeting them there and they were on the shore. It says, when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. In Matthew 20, as Jesus is leaving Jericho, a large crowd is following him along and there's two buying blind men on the side of the road screaming out for his help. And it says that Jesus had compassion on them and he touched their eyes. If you were here last week and heard Randy's message, he focused on the power of touch. You see, Jesus was not hesitant in mercy. Jesus was not hesitant in touching lives that needed help. And in God's love for people, Jesus would give them not only what they needed, but he also gave them what they weren't necessarily wanting. He gave them God's grace. Jesus, as we see in this text, he saw a man blind from birth, and he was filled with compassion. The disciples saw the blind man, and they rushed to accusation. Verse 2, his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I ask myself and you this morning, what do you see when you come across a life that's wrecked with pain? Either physical pain or possibly a spiritual deficit in their heart and life? Do you see a person with compassion? Or do we jump to what the disciples did and instead we we want to place the sin of accusation upon them? In verses 3 through 5, Jesus redirects the disciples in in indictment of this man away from from the questioning of his condemnation toward God's greater purpose, Jesus' mission. Jesus' mission was to accomplish God's work of grace in people's lives, including this blind man. Because you see, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, to save the world. Grace in a man. If you will, look at verse 6. After saying this, he spit in the ground, made some mud with saliva, and he put it on the man's eyes. Oh, the power of touch. Jesus was not hesitant in touching the lives of those who needed help. He was a blind man. The perception of the Jewish leaders was echoed by the disciples. He was a man whose life was filled with sin. Ah, but as we look at this text, we see a powerful lesson we all can learn from Jesus as his disciples. To look beyond sin's indictments on people and in mercy extend a hand of grace to accomplish God's work in their life. Because... While we were still, what? Sinners. Christ died for us. In the eyes of the law and religion, this blind man was nothing more than a life filled with sin. But in Jesus' eyes of love and relationship, Jesus saw that this is an opening for God's might to be displayed. This is a time for God's grace to be revealed, an opportunity for God to be glorified. And in mercy, Jesus touches the man and he offers God's grace. In verse 7, go, he said to him, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed. Jesus' compassion, the master's touch. But do you notice in the text that Jesus also calls for obedience on the man's part? He needed to make his way down into the pool 
And he needed to wash himself by Jesus' own command. Jesus himself says in John 14, he makes it clear that we are called to obedience in, in our in relationship with God and him. Those who accept my commands, Jesus said, will obey them. The one who loves me will, 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 will obey me. I will reveal myself to them. So on the receiving end of God's wonderful gift of grace, we see a heart of reliance, a repentive spirit of compliance, one who's willing to follow through in obedience on their part as the receiver. Yes, salvation is found in God's grace, a gift. And Jesus applies his personal eye solve on the man. Yet even a gift received by the master needs one to receive it in obedience. As Jesus said, go and wash in the pool. I need to take a side note right here and also reflect on similar words that were echoed by the disciples on the day of Pentecost. When the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out, when heaven's gates were opened and the free gift of God's grace was available to all people through the message of the cross, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, one receiving, on the receiving end of God's wonderful gift of grace, you see a heart of reliance, a repentive spirit of compliance, and it tells us in that account in Acts 2 that those that accepted the message were baptized and 3,000 men were added to that number to the day. A follow-through of obedience on the part of the receiver. So the man went and washed. In the darkness of blindness, down those steps into the pool, He'd been down in that pool before to take a drink, find some refreshment. But now he enters the very waters of that pool in obedience. And there's the splashing of water. There's the hope of restoration. And suddenly the darkness breaks with his very first glimpse of hope revealed. Could this really be happening? A life that's lived in darkness now clearly visible. And verse 7 says, and he came home seeing. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Verse 8 of the text, his neighbors and those who formerly seen him begging ask, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claim that he was, others said, no, no, he only looks like him. But he, the man himself said, I am that man. And in verses 10 through 12, he's questioned by his friends and he has no problem telling them exactly what he has experienced. Look at verse 13. They brought him to the Pharisee, the man who had been blind. Now the day in which Jesus made this mud and opened this man's eyes, it was the Sabbath. Therefore, this Pharisee also asked him how he received his sight. So we see in verses 15 through 34, he's brought to the Sanhedrin. It's the Jewish high court, the man of the law. And, and they question him. How... Could this terrible thing happen on the Sabbath day, the breaking of the Sabbath law? In verse 16, the, the Pharisees make it clear their position. This, this, this man's not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a sinner perform such signs? And says they were, they were divided among them. And the man who's born blind in verse 17 he seems unfazed by this legalistic logistics of religion. Instead, he answers their skepticism with his conclusion. He's a prophet. Verse 18. 
But those religious leaders still did not believe that he had been blind and, and had received his sight until they sent for his man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one who you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? Verses 20 through 23, they're desperate to try to discredit the miracle. To promote their preconceived accusations about Jesus. To turn this man's parents, they turn to him to discredit the testimony of this man and his healing. Now the parents know the consequences if they should acknowledge that Jesus is this chosen one from God. So they kind of they, they kind of squirm around the question. They, they divert it back to their son. Verse 24 tells us that a second time these Pharisee leaders summoned the man and had been blind and said, give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. Pharisee and religious leaders' motivation was not the truth. It was accusations it was implications. It was condemnation for this man and for Jesus because he didn't live up to their religious ideals. I love the courage of this blind man in the midst of the Sanhedrin. In verse 25, it says, the man replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. I'm not a religious leader. I don't have all your knowledge and insights of Scripture I don't know, but one thing I do know for a fact that's true. I was blind, and now I see. So I ask you, when we look at this account, who are truly the blind ones here? The man answered, I have told you already in verse 27, as he continued to cross-examine him, but you don't want to listen. And then he turns the question back on them. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciple as well? Oh, boy, that stung the Pharisees and Jewish leaders. As they continued to pound the point of him being a sinner and Jesus being a sinner, in verse 30 it says, the man replies boldly. Now, that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, but I do. Because he opened my eyes. Jesus in Matthew 13, 13 says, See, though they see, they do not see. Though they hear, they do not hear nor understand. The bottom line with these pious leaders is they were so entangled with their rituals and religion, they could not see the love of God for a broken-hearted person. They just could not see God's desire for a relationship and restoration in him, or maybe appropriately, they didn't want to see it. The blind man, the one these Jewish leaders called steeped in sin at birth in verse 34, the once blind man could see clearly who Jesus was. His eyes were open to much more than the gift of sight. They were open to the ultimate gift of God's grace. God, instead of abandoning us, leaving us to suffer in our sin, our sin-filled lives, cursed, hopeless, He offers us a gift. The best gift we've ever been given. It was Jesus. Grace in a manger. It was destined for a cross. Is it also possible for us to give that gift of grace this Christmas? I think it's nearly impossible for us to give the gift unless ourselves, our eyes, are open to the truth. Like this blind man. Our eyes are open to the greatest gift that could ever be given to us, that which was given to us at the original Christmas. Our eyes need to be wide open as we observe the nativity scene and we focus our attention on the manger and we see a babe that's undeserved, an unmerited gift from God. 
Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 2, it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourself, it's a gift of God. It's not from your works so that no one can boast in you. You do understand that each of us that know Jesus Christ and have accepted him as our Lord and Savior, we have been touched by the grace of God, just like this blind man. We were once in the darkness of sin without hope and living a life as the walking dead with the fingers of sin-filled accusations being pointed at us as well until Jesus came to us and he placed his very nail-scarred hands upon our lives. And we too obeyed and made our way to the pool of his ultimate cleansing to open our eyes and to be enlightened to the ultimate gift of salvation. Paul tells the Galatians, he says, for all of us who were baptized have clothed yourself with Christ. No greater gift has ever been given. No example of generosity so selfless. No act in human history so important than Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. There is no event in the world more important than the one that unifies people with God and brings eternity and abundant life. Oh, the manger. It's such a familiar picture in Christmas that we maybe have forgotten the unimaginable sacrifice behind it. That Jesus left his kingdom of heaven, his glory, to take on a human flesh so that I and you could be restored. So our blind eyes could be open to God's word. Oh, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Earlier in this message, I asked in the midst of this holiday season of festivities, how do we pass on the ultimate gift that we have received from Jesus? How can we display grace in a manger to others so they too can open it up and beam with delight? The pious religious leaders in John 9 were so entangled in their rituals and in their religion that they could not see the love of God for the brokenhearted they just could not see God's desire for a relationship to, in those who needed to be restored. They were blind to God's grace. So I ask ourselves, I ask myself, have I been blinded by the same standards? The first thing we need to do is open our eyes wide to the grace in the manger before we can share that ultimate gift. We today as disciples of Jesus Christ have been commissioned with the task to share this gift with others that so desperately need it. And the second is we need to see the lost as Jesus did. If you have not been attending our Bible class at 9 o'clock, you are missing a huge, huge encouragement about your role as a disciple. Kyle Eilerman has been unfolding this concept that our job to take the message of Jesus Christ to others is not some great, magnificent event, but how he has commissioned us as Jesus' example to take one life at a time the way Jesus did. In fact, in last week's lesson, he asked that we would pray, and it was challenged to those in the group to pray this as they enter the next week. I'm going to challenge you as well to take this prayer into this next week so you too can understand what it means to look at one life at a time, the question of how we can live that way, the way Jesus did. And here's the prayer. Jesus 
Let's say it together. Jesus, give me your eyes for the one. Help me to see people the way you see people. You see, it starts with making a commitment to pray a simple prayer and put on the eyes that Jesus had and see them the way he did. So can I ask you a serious question today? How do you really see those around you that are spiritually blind? Those whose lives are ravished with sin. Those who proclaim and maybe promote even the dynamics of immorality. Those within their bodies that just show forth their disregard, their rebellion for God in His way. I ask you today, how do we really see those who are spiritually blind, who are stained in the filth of depravity? Are we like the disciples and the pious, and pious uh, Pharisees? To say, well, they were just steeped in the birth since death. That, that's who they are. They're just sinners. That's the way they always have been. That's the way they always will be. How do we really see those who are spiritually blind? Oh, Jesus, give us eyes like yours. Help us to see people the way you see them. May I offer a suggestion this Christmas? That we make a commitment this season to reach out during Christmas season and share the loving touch of Jesus with someone who so desperately needs his healing. Out in the lobby, I have provided 120 gift cards. Here's my challenge to you. As this service wraps up and you go home, would you honestly go to God and say, God, lay someone on my heart that desperately needs you, a neighbor, a co-worker, someone in your family. Maybe you just have to have an open-ended prayer. God, I don't know who that person is, but I want you to lay on my heart someone who desperately needs to see your love, and I need to see them the way you see them. Would you take one of these tags with you when you leave? Maybe two, 120 opportunities for you to share the love of God. Two things you can do. One is pray, how can you share that? Yep, maybe it's a plate of cookies. Maybe it's a prayer. Maybe it's a letter of encouragement. Maybe it's just a friendly. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's, it's just taking them something or letting them know how much you care about them. Maybe it's just taking it home and hanging it on your tree and keeping that person in prayer throughout the Christmas season. If you're not nearby, that God will bring their way someone who will see their blindness and touch them with the love of Jesus Christ. 120 tags, 120 opportunities for us to see people the way God sees them. Instead of seeing them as people steeped in sin, Seeing them instead as opportunities for God to be glorified. Every Christmas, we search for the perfect gift. And we wrap it with expectations of the thrill that that Christmas gift will bring on Christmas morning when the ultimate gift that's just right is unwrapped. Can we this year share the ultimate gift of Christmas with someone who needs their eyes open. To a person or persons, you can reach one life at a time. Someone you could touch with the very love of Jesus Christ, that you can make an impact in their life that's because of the grace that's in the manger. So that they too, this Christmas, can beam with the light. As we close this service, and some scriptures that will be up on the screen. Would you just close your eyes and ask God to bring to your heart who that might be that is so blind, so desperately needs Jesus. Lay that name or persons or persons on your heart so that you can be the one to tell them of Jesus. And after the scriptures are read, a short little video clip as we will close this service and a holiday of praise with joy to the world.
Let's be still and let God speak to our hearts this morning. But now that you have been set free from sin, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. The result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God raised us up with Christ in order that in the coming ages we might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. You're here to be light, bringing out God's colors to the world. God is not a secret to be kept. I'm putting you on a light stand. Shine! Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive. Son is given, and the 
the government will be on his shoulders and he'll be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace he rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness. Father, I pray over each tag that is going to be taken from this place as you lay on our hearts that we will be empowered with this wonderful message that was given to the shepherds. The message of Jesus, the hope of the world. Empower us in boldness. Let us indeed be your ambassadors so that the kingdom, our friends, and our neighbors will know of this wonderful gift of grace found in Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. The display is out in the lobby. Please help yourself to some tags as you leave. God's blessings upon you today.